The story of Skypiea is one of the most fascinating arcs in all of One Piece. However, some would dare argue that for as wondrous as it may be, it feels detached and unrelated to the rest of the grander story. In fact, some would even dare say that you should skip the arc altogether. But I would argue that not only is the Skypiea arc vitally important to the story in many ways, but that the story of the people of the sky reflects the story of the world below, and in a lot of ways it completely parallels and foreshadows the entire series from start to end. And most importantly of all, it foreshadows exactly how One Piece will end. The story of Skypiea is a microcosm of the story of the world of One Piece, because despite being isolated from everyone else, its inhabitants are no different than humans, and so similar events and history repeated over both worlds. Thus, if we take a look at the history of Skypiea, we'll be able to understand the history of the world of One Piece and what actually happened before, during and after the Void Sentry. The parallels between this civilization and the rest of the world will help us understand exactly not just that, but also what is going to be the final scene and resolution of the series once the One Piece treasure is discovered. However, I'd like to start things off by taking a look not at the history of the sky, but starting off with the history of the world below, to then later understand the parallels that link the two. In the previous episode, we established our main premise for this thesis about what Luffy's true dream is, that being to throw the biggest party in the world. However, now that we have established that foundation, it is time to go back in time and go through all the events of the history of the world of One Piece from the very start. And to achieve that, we'll have to start at the very, very beginning of everything. Before the main story, before the Void Sentry, before all the events that unfolded in this world, at the beginning of everything. At first, there was nothing, and then, there was light, a big bang which gave birth to the known universe, and somewhere, in the corner of some galaxy, a world was born. This world, much like our own, passed through one of many geological eras, shifting and evolving through millions and even billions of years, eventually leading to its biggest change, the birth of life. At first, species were aquatic, but eventually moved on to land. These species grew and evolved, leading to the era of the dinosaurs. At some point, the world became covered mostly in water, with thousands of islands scattered all over. At this stage, the world resembled a lot more how it currently looks. However, I would dare state that its two most distinct features, the supercontinent Red Line and the Ocean Grand Line, at that time did not yet exist. But we'll tackle that subject later. Either way, none of this really matters much at the present, because regardless of the geological eras and regardless of the dinosaurs and other life forms, the true protagonists of this story would be mankind. Evolved from the same common ancestors as today's apes, a new race made its way into the world. Humans. Homo sapiens. And yet what truly sets this world apart from ours was that not only did humans appear, but many other types of hominids did as well. Races that aren't quite identical to humans, but possess very similar body shapes, opposite thumbs, bipedal builds, and most importantly, the same level of intelligence. Unlike our world, its people are not just differentiated by their gender and their skin color, but also by their fins, their fur, their wings, or their sizes. Alongside humans, many more creatures began to populate the world. And this is not counting other types of races and subspecies, or the difference between the individuals within each race, such as the countless classifications for fishfolk, merfolk, or minks. The sheer variety the world offered in its inhabitants provided a beautiful amount of diversity, with so many different creatures, with different abilities, strengths, and attributes. Cultures began to form around the world, and through the invention of ships, exploration became available, leading to the colonization of more and more territories. Kingdoms arose and civilizations developed. We know that kingdoms like that of Alabasta have existed for well over 4,000 years, becoming major political powers ever since ancient times. 
All these events led to all these different species and cultures to interact together. One would imagine that with such diversity, such varied skill sets, yet so much in common, all of these races would be able to put their unique traits to good use and build a prosperous future together. But sadly, the truth of history is far darker than that. Hidden beneath these lofty ideals lie a violent and bloodstained history. People are so much more than just wild beasts. They are intelligent, they value emotion, heart, and have morals and values. They value peace and joy. Yet at their core, they are also deeply driven by their instincts, by their weaknesses. In a survivalist mentality, what is right work is what is safer, and so we become afraid of the different. Ideally, it is through courage that man thrusts himself into the different and learns to understand it to better make use of it. But history has shown us that not everybody has that courage, and many were frightened by the different. In spite of all that these races share together, in spite of sharing the same red blood, their differences scared them. Their differences frightened them, and this fear led to seeing each other as threats, shifting the blame onto others and treating them like creatures who are inferior. This feeling is not one that belonged to one singular race either, but there was one critical detail that completely changed how these events developed. These races all differed in strength. Humans were strong, but the likes of fishmen, dwarves, or giants were stronger by biological nature. Yet for as powerful as they were, there was one attribute that they all lacked. Numbers. And that is what humans likely had above all else. No matter how weak they might have been, humans were just more numerous. Their strength in numbers allowed them to become the majority, making them the normal, and everything else that which was inferior. Any hope for equality was shattered, turning into seeds of discrimination, prejudice, and racism. Racism is a very major theme in One Piece. It may not seem like it at first glance, but I'd go as far as to argue that it's a driving force for the core theme of the entire series. While well, some might think that this is just a way to offer political commentary in our world, which, by all means, it is, it is also fundamentally rooted across the entire world of One Piece. Because the truth is, racism has plagued the history of the world of One Piece, much like it has plagued that of our own. We have seen firsthand the effects that racism has had on the fishfolk and the merfolk, with humans treating them as nothing more than fishes, something that has been explored in great lengths during the Sabaody and Fishman Island arcs. But we've also seen this in so many other cases. For example, according to Gancho, the chief of the Tantata, even prior to the Void Century, dwarves had been hunted by humans for a very long time. They were seen as nothing more than an amusing creature, an animal to be caught as a collector's item, to be hunted like bugs. They were eventually approached by the human king of Dressrosa, King Don Quixote, to be provided shelter, but even he betrayed them and enslaved them, paving the way for what would become known as the Great Tuntata Era of Slavery, a brutal, ruthless, and merciless period of time which remaining records describe as nothing short of a living hell. Even in current cases in the story, such as with someone like Pudding, we've seen the degree of discrimination that they can go through. Despite how varied Tatalan can be, Pudding's third eye was rare enough that she was bullied and discriminated against for it. Even her own mother, for as much as she wants to pretend to live in her delusional world of equality, she too claimed to be creeped out by her eye, viewing her like a weird monster. It would be years until Pudding would meet someone who did consider her beautiful for being different. And even in isolated cases like the Wano Country, we've seen how Kawamatsu and his mother were discriminated against for being different from the rest of humans there, ultimately leading to his mother's death, asking her son to lie about his race to protect his own life. There are countless and countless other accounts of discrimination across the series, yet there is one detail that you might not have thought about that goes to show just how persecuted the races of the world really are. Let's play a game. Try to imagine a random island in the series and try to picture the people living there. What do you see? Chances are, if you haven't chosen one of the few unique exceptions, the island you visualized is filled with humans. Only humans. 
Aside from Totland and some other exceptions, such as Pirate Cruise, we really haven't seen any of the world's many races ever coexisting much with humans. All of those islands are filled with so many humans, sure, but only humans, because after all, if that racism is so deeply rooted, how could all these races live alongside humans? Take another example, the Marines. Think about all the Marines we've seen across the series. They're all humans. Now, admittedly, there is an exception because giants are also in the Marines, but as Law explained, that is simply a special exception given their unbelievable military power. But aside this rare exception, has there ever been any other Marine who wasn't human? Any fishmen, skyfolk, even long arms or long legs? No. They're all humans. The world government, the world nobles, the marines, and their many kingdoms are all filled with just that. Humans. So if humans were the prevailing species, where could all the other races go? If humans could hunt them down, where could they escape to? The answer is, to places where humans could not reach them. The one advantage some of these races had was that they had specific traits or circumstances which allowed them to access places that humans could not reach. For example, the fish folk and merfolk could breathe underwater, so they went to live on the seafloor, because no human could ever reach them there. Fishman Island was said to have originally been a popular gathering spot of sea folk, because it was where the roots of the sun tree Eve reached, making it the only place in the seafloor where light arrives. They might have fish-like attributes, but in the end, sea folk are no different from humans. They love the sun. The sun brings them joy. Of course, this sunlight of the ocean could never compare to the light of the real sun, but that was nothing more than a dream for them. Similar is the story of the minks. Persecuted by humans, they could do nothing more than go live on the back of the colossal elephant Zunisha, to survive and stay away from humans, allowing them to vanish on this unreachable island, isolating themselves for centuries. And the same can be said for a lot of other races. The giants stayed at Albuf and became a culture of warriors because it was the only way to protect themselves. The Kujas sought refuge at Amazon Lily, a natural fortress made to defend from enemies. Much like the giants, the Kuja learned to be warriors and prioritized strength above all else in their culture, replacing outdated ideals of beauty being defined by one's attractiveness to beauty being defined by one's strength. And they also created the law of outlawing any man from reaching the island, because most of their enemies happened to be men, and a force of women alone would likely not be able to stand against them. Whether it's the Mings being trained to be like warriors since birth, or the tribal warrior culture of the Shandians, all of these species had to fight to even stay alive, and so their cultures became like those of warriors. While others, like the dwarves, were not as lucky, becoming enslaved by humans, though the few that could escape became fierce warriors and hid in the ground away from the eyes of humans. All of these show us that racism was very much present across this world's history, and that it nearly drove so many of these races to extinction, forcing them to seek refuge in parts of the world where they would not be pursued. This element might not seem as important now, but trust me, keep it in mind, because as we move forward, this history of racism will become one of the fundamental catalysts for the existence of the One Piece. However, we're forgetting one race, aren't we? The Skyfolk. What place could they go where they could ensure that humans would never pursue them there? You might think at first the Sky Island, sure, but what if they went beyond, to the farthest reach, the final frontier, the moon? There is a bit of a misconception in our community that the Skyfolk were born on the moon. After all, we know they came down from the moon, making some think that the species originated there. But that's not how evolution works. Skyfolk are obviously hominids, they possess the same traits as humans and evidently had a common ancestor, meaning that both originated from the same place, much like how all humans in our world are said to come from Africa. They were clearly not born on the moon, but rather were born on the planet below and went up there at some point. And I mean, it makes sense. If once upon a time they had wings as large as kings, they could have just flown there. We've seen the moon, unlike ours, is not really that impossible to reach and is somewhere closer to the point where it likely is covered by the atmosphere, allowing living beings to breathe there. We saw how easily Enel got there with his sheep, or how the automata flew there with... <laughs> <laughs> literally just balloons, so it's not absurd to think the Skyfolk just 
flew there, flew so far to a point that no human could ever reach them, to a paradise where they could live in peace without the meddling of humans, or in other words, an utopia. The capital of Burka they founded on the moon was truly an utopia. Undisturbed, they were able to progress and advance as a society, developing their technology to an impressive level. After all, war, hatred and the opposition of progress are what stagnates societies. And it is those that are able to be open-minded and peaceful that manage to make the biggest technological leaps. Thanks to that, Skyfog invented machinery, advanced mechanism and even sentient species of robots known as the Automata. Regardless, the sky folk, referred to as the moon folk during this period, were able to lead forward this prosperous society, this utopia known as the moon city of Burka. It truly was a beautiful society, one where there was no discrimination nor prejudice. But for as wonderful as it was, there was one critical flaw that put an end to this civilization. Resources. For as peaceful as the moon was, its resources were limited. No wildlife, no trees or water, only a wasteland of Earth. Life in the moon was simply not realistic anymore, and so, as depicted on the moon murals we saw in the cover story, the moon folk abandoned their home and returned to the planet below, where war and persecution were certainly still threats, but where they at least could survive in some form or another. On the moon, the moon folk already seemed to have split into three different factions, three specific sub-races with mild biological differences. The original names are unknown, but today these are known as the Shandorians, more tribalistic in nature and with mid-sized wings, the Skypeans, with slightly smaller wings and a cultural tendency to style their hair in the shape of antennae, and finally the Burkans, who possess larger and more angled wings. These three factions were a bit distinct from each other, but in spite of their differences, they managed to live together in harmony. However, when they descended to the planet below, they eventually parted ways. As we currently know, the moon folk, now the sky folk, divided themselves to live in three different islands. The island of Jaya, where the city of Shandora was located, and the sky islands Skypea and Burka. It is unclear why one of the three factions lived in the Blue Sea and the others lived in the sky, but it's possible that they all descended to the Blue Sea at first, as indicated by the moon murals, but two of these races eventually discovered that clouds were inhabitable, finding a new place to stay away from humans. The Sky Islands were still a far cry from the moon, as humans could still reach them via several traveling methods, but at least it gave them a bit more peace than the land below could. However, for as heavily as the sky was, and for all the resources it did provide, ironically, it lacked the one resource they had always possessed. The one resource they had so much of to the point it was superfluous, despite lacking all other resources. Earth, or... Verth, as they called it in their culture, because the moon was just that, a wasteland of Earth. And yet in the sky, Earth was the one thing that just was not available. Without Earth, they couldn't plant or grow crops, which made it a very valuable resource. The sky folk yearned for the Verth, and most importantly, they yearned for their homeland. The moon folk would never return to the moon. What was once an utopia free of hatred and discrimination was simply not realistically sustainable anymore. And yet this yearning for the moon never disappeared. This yearning became symbolized in the Verth itself, the one thing they had in abundance in their utopia, but lacked in their new countries. The moon thus became part of Skyfolk legend and religion. This legendary land, this utopia, came to be known as Fairy Verth, a legendary land that all Skyfolk yearn for, a true paradise. That is why they named each of their new homelands with names based on the original homeland. Burka, the name of the ancient moon city, Shandora, which is based on Chandra, the Hindi deity of the moon, and Skypea, a combination of the sounds for sky and utopia. Across the entirety of the arc of Skypea, we are told of this fairy birth, this land of eternal earth, this paradise that all the sky folk seek. Yet the story never specifies what it is. And all refers to it as this dreamlike utopia. He yearns to go there because he feels like it's a fitting place for a god. And at the very end, it's real that all this time, Fairy Earth was the moon. But what Enel failed to realize is that it was an utopia not because it was some paradise worthy of a god, but because it was a place free of persecution, free from human hatred. It was the utopia that all the Skyfolk once lived at, something that over time became nothing more than the staff of legends. 
In chapter 244, we stumble upon an Earth idol located in the center of Angel Island, a religious figure for the Sky Folk. When describing the idol, Connis explains... Because this eternal yearning was to return to their homeland, the moon to fairy earth itself. Something that the sky folk eternally yearn for, something that normal humans could never comprehend, the desire to return to their long lost utopia. One where they could be safe away from humans, where they could simply be at peace. That was all that they wanted. I feel that many people often overestimate the importance of the moon in the series, like it's the key to everything and something massively important, and while it is true that the moon does hold quite a bit of symbolism and has impacted other cultures beyond that of the sky folk, something that holds true in our own world as well, I don't think this importance is to the degree that some chalk it up to be. I've seen some people speculate that the moon is perhaps where the Great Kingdom is located, or the celestial dragons are aliens who came from the moon, or that it's the One Piece itself, but uh, honestly, no. I just don't think it's as important as some people think it is. Its presence in the story has been relegated to just a cover story, one most anime fans don't even have an idea exists, and even that is just a continuation of the story of Skypiea. The story of the moon is the story of the sky folk, a part of the story of Skypiea, as simple as that. But it's understanding the story that is really important to understanding the greater whole, and you'll understand very soon why. However, back to our story, the characteristic of yearning for birth is something that only afflicted this sky folk that lived in the sky, because the Shandorians eventually moved on. For them, Earth was plenty, and this time they had both the Earth and the resources to sustain themselves, and since they assumed a tribalistic and warrior-like culture, that allowed them to fend themselves against humans quite well. So they simply moved on. They moved on with their lives and moved on from the legend of the moon. They would come to worship their own gods and craft their own culture, completely detached from that of the sky. And eventually, one day, they would also come to forge friendship with humans. However, in an ironic twist of fate, the destinies of both the people of the sky and the sky folk of the sea would one day once again intertwine with each other. On one fated day for hundred years in the past, a knock-up stream erupted beneath the island of Jaya, shooting it into the sky. The island would land near Skypea, making the people of that land feel like that chunk of Jaya, the enormous amount of earth, was a gift bestowed to them, one that they were in the right to possess. This led to war. Both factions wanted this large chunk of Earth for themselves, giving start to a war that would last for entire four centuries. Things took a turn for the wars, but eventually the Verkans invaded as well, led by youth by the name of Enel. Enel proclaimed himself the god of the skies, and driven by the desire of power, he annihilated and destroyed his country of Burka, leaving as survivors only those who had left the island at some point in the past, and those Enel took with him to invade Skypea. This conflict between two countries became a conflict between three, making the situation even more dire. But the true irony of it all is the fact that while all these factions came from different places, different islands in the sky and the blue sea, they were all sky folk, yet they still saw each other as different. These people who had once lived side by side in this peaceful utopia were at their throats over something they could have easily shared. All the more ironic because the Shandians had once managed to set apart their differences with another race, but in an attempt to preserve that bond, they ended up creating such a long and bloodstained struggle. All they needed to understand was that if they could share this earth with each other, then this entire conflict would be solved. The solution to this war was simply to unite everyone together, and yet they could never achieve that. In that regard, the history of the moon and Skypea is the perfect microexample of how things were for the rest of the world. Their history is a replica of the history of the world, and understanding how things developed on Skypea will help us comprehend how things would develop everywhere else. Because much like the rest of the world, Skypea was in a situation where those of different races would fight against each other just because of their differences, leading to this endless cycle of hatred and fear that would continue across the generations, being taught to future children. This led to a 400-year-long war, one that seemed like it would never, ever end. Until one day, a certain boy appeared. One day, a young boy would finally land on Skypea, not in search of war or conquest, 
but simply in search of adventure. And much like he would one day change the history of the world, this boy changed the history of Skypiea by bringing everybody there together. He rose to defeat the one who was playing at being God and helped put a stop to this long war by connecting all those different races as one, by spreading joy among the people of the sky. But how could he achieve that? What could this man possibly do? What could he possibly bring that would be so revolutionary to bring joy to the people of the sky and stop this hatred that persisted for centuries in a single instant? So, this joyous boy helped connect all those who had been divided for so many centuries through the simple act of throwing a massive party. A party where everyone could throw away hatred and discrimination and instead indulge in joy and laughter. And it is this massive party that would not only connect all people together as equals, but it is also this massive party that would allow everyone to finally laugh together. <laughs> and one day, eventually, this boy would throw a party so big that it would connect the entire world together, connecting those who were scattered and divided and uniting them as one, just like he did for the people of the sky. But of course, that is a story we haven't reached yet. And for this boy to accomplish such a grand feat, he would need a massive treasure, one that could quite literally bring the world together in one piece. But that is a story no one yet knows about.